Good morning everyone, my name is Sarah Doherty and I am the Marketing and Events Coordinator here at Hornbill. I would like to welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar where we'll be having a presentation on simplifying the challenges of modern ITSM with Stephen Boardman, Product Manager and Simon Cooper, New Business Lead here at Hornbill. Just to inform you, Delegate Auto will be muted during the presentation to help facilitate flow and timekeeping. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the GoToMeeting question facility on the right-hand side of your screen. We will collate questions and answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you for taking the time to attend. I will now pass you over to Stephen and Simon. Thanks, uh, Sarah. Good morning, all. My name is Simon Cooper. Um, I'm part of the sales function here. Um, I just wanted to welcome everyone this morning. Um, what we intend to do over the next 40 to 50 minutes is provide a presentation on the simplifying the challenges of modern ITSM. What I'm going to do is uh, run through a quick presentation on the challenges, and Steve, my colleague, colleague is going to show how we demonstrate that, uh, demonstrate that through the product. Um, after that, we're going to round up with some non-functional benefits of using Hornbill, and equally at the end, we'll ask um, answer any questions that uh, may be answered through the session. So. Without further ado, I'm just going to press on with uh, the first part of the presentation. So simplifying the challenges, what we've uh, come up with is some key challenges associated with modern ITSM. Now these are not just specific to deliver delivering service management solutions, but they're challenges that we've uncovered over the last two decades working with our customers and when we've implemented new solutions and upgraded um, customers from their previous solution to um, at, at the software that we provide. So again, it's not a definitive list, but again, what we try to do is break it down into pro uh, five key areas. So if we take the first one, which is around upgrades. Now, essentially, upgrades, this is a common theme that we hear when they're visiting our customers and prospects, that us upgrades are complex, they're, they're hard to do, and for a lot of organizations, um, they sometimes become cost prohibitive when you're actually looking to move forward. So again, upgrades is not just specific to on-premise solutions, it applies to SaaS-based solutions as well. And again, the longer you leave that gap, the harder it is. And for some organizations, they just they go back to market purely because up the upgrade path becomes too prohibitive around cost and functionality. Another key area that comes into play is customization. Now again, Customization is inevitable and, and the service management solutions are, are highly customizable and that, that means that they can be tailored to your needs. What falls out of that is that um, a highly customized solution becomes harder to support and going forward supporting, supporting them solutions becomes more difficult. And again, taking into context what I just mentioned about upgrades, when you do upgrade, for a lot of times, a lot of the organizations find that the customiza customizations are difficult to reapply, and equally some of those customizations just don't work going forward. The third area that is very uh, popular that we pick up on is complexity. Now when we talk about complexity, we're not just talking about the complexity of the solution or service management solution, it's the complexity of actually delivering that into the business. By the nature of service management solutions, they're, com they're complex. But equally, there's um, the, the complexity of the infrastructure. Now, that may be around the integration, keeping that solution working. And that complexity um, requires knowledge and expertise. And within an organization, you know, that can be a uh, hidden overhead that needs to be constantly maintained. And equally, around the complexity, if we want to build redundancy into uh, the knowledge and expertise, there's training that may need to be applied for additional staff. And again, if these people move on, there's a hidden cost around training so that they can keep that solution up and running within your organization. Usability. Now, again, more and more in that, the consumer world that we work, you know, solutions are there at our fingertips. They're easy to use. They're intuitive. And uh, in some ways, a lot of the, the service management solutions and business apps that use still have a long way to go to actually reach that intuitiveness where people can just log on to a solution and they can actually use it. And a lot of um, customers and prospects uh, have, have always uh, maintained that service management solutions aren't necessarily as intuitive as they could be. Another area that drops out, which is, is a common thread that we've seen for a long time, is communicating outside uh, effectively with colleagues. And what we mean by that is, once a service management solution is implemented, um, it acts as a call login solution, it follows ITIL uh, principles and disciplines. But again, when we communicate with colleagues and customers, 
typically that happens outside of the solution with an example of email. And again, the audit trail is not necessarily carried through. And, and another tenure that comes out is meaningful reports. All the information that I put into the service management solutions, getting those reports out is difficult. For some organizations, they actually export it back into Excel. Now that's not the, you know, necessarily the, the most efficient way of actually using it. So again, you know, usability, certainly um, email communication and reporting are two key areas that have been continually mentioned to us. And what does this all sort of mean? It means that the cost of ownership goes up. So again, cost and complexity goes up and the business is constantly driving us to reduce the cost and complexity while maintaining a first class service to the organisation. So again, there's hidden costs around that. And equally, it's improving um, the ITSM best practice that um, we want to see in tools evolving going forward. And again, some of these, uh, those features that we'll bring out when Steve actually demonstrates the product. So just moving across, you know, what have we done at Hornbill? Well, again, what we've done is we've built a, a worked around a simple yet powerful idea. What we did a, a few years ago was take time and stop to look at how the, the world has changed. And certainly with the revolution of SaaS, mobile, and um, collaboration, it's meant that there's new technologies out there that we can actually embrace to simplify the, the delivery of business, um, business critical solutions within the organization. So at Hornbill, what we did was we created um, a collaborative platform. Now what this means is that you can easily engage and communicate with your colleagues, you can be in contact with them, you can receive updates, but more importantly you can share knowledge and you can have access to um, system specialists and that knowledge can be shared and reused within your organisation. Further to that, what we've created is um, a line of business applications that can be used to support our collaborative platform. So again we've got service manager, document manager, configuration manager. Now these applications can be installed as easy as installing apps on your phone. All of them are underpinned by um, business process and automation and again individually they're powerful but if they're integrated together they can add more value to your organization. Now what we intend today, today is to show you is using the collaborative platform that I've just mentioned and um, the line of business applications that we've just shown. So again, we're, what we'll be concentrating on today is service manager, we'll pick up on document manager, and also we'll explore configuration manager as well. And what this provides to the business is the ability to provide a collaborative service management solution. And this enables us within an organization to share knowledge and ideas more easily, collaborate with our colleagues and partners globally, boost productivity, and again, be able to access it um, anywhere on any device. Now, before Steve um, goes into demonstration, I just want to pick up on a, a, a two or three key areas. Effective communication. Now, within service management and service management, effective communication is key. And what we allow um, colleagues and customers to do is the ability to uh, communicate on any device at any time from any location. And also, we can address the language barrier as well. So if you're like us, you have customers and colleagues um, that work in different regions, we can address the global, um, the geographical, and the language barriers that sometimes can be prohibitive to giving good service. And what comes out of com effective communication is the ability to capture knowledge. Now, knowledge is very key, um, and two probably two areas that uh, we find very important is explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge. Now, explicit knowledge is probably more familiar. It's built around idle disciplines where we talk about knowledge management and knowledge documents, where knowledge is captured in process documents or procedure documents that are then uploaded and made available to the organization to actually um, exploit that knowledge. Now, tacit knowledge is just as powerful. Indeed, you know, we recognize it to be more powerful. And this is the knowledge here and now that is uh, essentially um, around communications or, or conversations and emails. And again, tacit knowledge is more about the knowledge that is passed between colleagues but is never reused. So, you know, an example is maybe I needed to find some information around Active Directory and I knew a colleague of mine, um, Abdi, was the person that uh, had that knowledge. Probably I'd ring him or talk to him, catch that knowledge, use it to resolve a ticket, but I wouldn't actually record it and let, allow it to be used within the organisation again. So we see tacit knowledge. As, just as powerful as explicit knowledge, and Steve will show you some examples of how we can actually use that knowledge going forward. 
Now, software in the service, whenever as an organization you're looking to actually go out and buy a new bit of software, whether that's within service management or with any software within the organization, there's a key distinction between software and service. And again, when you're buying or considering a new um, application, what, what we want to, what you should consider is, you know, how is that application built? Um, how are upgrades made available? And how can you take advantage of those um, applications? Here at Hornbill, we, have, we use continual software deployment. Now, what that means is that a developer can check in functionality. Um, it can be enhanced, it can be tested, and it can be delivered continually to um, the service. A bit like um, Google or, or Facebook, the features just keep applying, it keeps working. This is completely normal, uh, normal to us. So again, with Hornbill, what, we've, what we're providing is a solution that essentially has no upgrades. All of them are applied automatically. So again, it just continually keeps working. The upshot of that is you're always on the latest features. There's no service interruptions. And what is key is that your customizations and your configurations just keep on working. So I know I've said, spoken a lot, and we can this, this will be recorded so you can um, play it back at your leisure. What I'm going to do now is pass over to my colleague Steve, and then I'll come back to you a bit later with um, the non-functional benefits of Hornbill. And also, myself and Steve will answer any questions that are posted on the webinar. So over to you, Steve. Great, thanks Simon. Good morning everyone. So as Simon said, we're going to spend probably about 20 minutes or so just having a look at service manager in operation. And what we'll do is have a look at uh, our end users experience of using service manager. Uh, we'll look at an analyst or a service delivery manager's view. But we'll also take uh, a brief look at what uh, metrics and data we can actually get out of service manager uh, through our advanced analytics package. So first and foremost, we're just going to look at the self-service experience that our users would have. And I'll just make a couple of observations here or comments. Firstly, we do support transparent single sign-on, so users won't need to, to log in or re-authenticate themselves. The portal is brandable and customizable codelessly through the admin tool. Uh, and every end user, whether it be an internal or an external customer, will receive a tailored experience based on the services you provide and the services that they are subscribed to. So if we take a look at this example here, I'm logged in as a particular user. Here I can see the services that I've marked as being my favorites. I look at all the services that are provided to me, whether that's provided through uh, IT or other uh, business units within the, uh, the organizations, sort of HR, finance facilities, etc. And I can switch between all of my IT services, my business specific services, or any of the other uh, service categories that you've defined. I can also look where I've got active requests, I can see where I've actually got uh, services which have been marked as being impacted uh, or not available by the IT team or any other service provider. And if we take a real world example here, where perhaps I'm working from home and I'm struggling to connect to my VPN, maybe I'll come onto my self-service portal, see any notifications that are specific to me and the services that I uh, consume, and I can see here that my home working service is impacted. So I can drop into that service and again look at the bulletins and the information that's being shared with me by the the IT team, but I can also then see whether there's any information that's going to allow me to self-help. So here we can see our known issues, and this is really about the IT team or other service provider letting you know in advance, proactively, that they're already aware of an issue, and they can detail out what that issue is. They can also push out here information about any workarounds that they may already have identified, and again, this may allow you to actually take that workaround, apply it, and continue working. If we took an example where actually they were aware of this issue but no workaround was available, what's the quick and easiest way for you to let them know that you are also impacted by this issue? Well, in Service Manager, we can just ask our users to simply click on the Me Too option. Now, this uh, negates the need to raise repeat incidents. The user doesn't have to go for that process. Simply clicking on the Me Too will add that user as an impacted user to that problem or known error. It will notify the team that are looking after that known error. Uh, which means they don't have to go looking for those repeat incidents and linking them to a problem or an error. And it'll also mean that going forward, the customer will receive any ongoing communications about a workaround and an eventual uh, resolution to that issue. But if there weren't any known issues in this uh, scenario, maybe there's some knowledge or information that's been uh, provided by their service team that will allow me again to self-help. And that could come in the format of uh, embedded media, videos, hyperlinks, uh, images, or it could be quite simplistic uh, textual instructions in terms of how you resolve those particular issues. 
We can also come in here if we're feeling um, that that information is useful. We can vote on it, and obviously we can then start to report on which articles are useful, being viewed, etc. But again, if there's no known issues or no FAQs that are going to help me on this particular occasion, we can then come into our service catalog or request catalog. And this is really about the, the options that are available to me against this particular service. So here I could actually just complete a, a series of questions and request a callback from someone in the team that supports our home working service. Maybe I'm new to the business and I actually want to set up my VPN client in the first place. So again, I might want to schedule that. Or it could be simply that I want to let the, uh, the team know that I'm actually experiencing an issue. The key thing here is that the end user is not presented with any ITIL terminology. There's no concepts of instance and service requests and having to make a choice. I simply choose the option that's uh, presented to me. So I'm just going to go ahead and put some information in here. I'm able to connect. And this is really just our progressive capture approach where we just guide the user through the information we need to be able to either triage um, or uh, fulfill their uh, request uh, as quick as possible. So I'm just going to associate the impacted uh, device, so the laptop's the one that's struggling to connect, and I'll go ahead and click on finish. Now on doing so, that ticket will get routed to the appropriate team, but as an end user here, I'll have immediate visibility of the fulfillment process that the team are going to go through to actually get my issue resolved for them. This is very much like um, if you ever ordered a pizza from Domino's online, it's just going to guide you through those steps. So when the order's been received, when it's been put in the oven, when it's out for delivery. So you can obviously pop back at any time to see how they're progressing with your, your issue. And again, that will obviously be supported by email notifications at any key uh, trigger points that you need. So once we've got requests raised against that particular service, you can also look at the request tab, and that's going to show you the ones that are active or closed. Or if you've actually um, closed any tickets and the service team have pushed out a, uh, a survey to see how they performed, you can click on the ones that are awaiting your feedback and then you can decide if you want to participate, provide your feedback, opt out, or potentially save that for later. Now with all that in mind, that's, that's great if a, a user knows where to start, but if they're not too sure because you offer lots and lots of different services and it's not just very obvious from the icons where I need to go, they can simply use the federated search across the middle. So here I could come in and say, actually, I've got an issue with VPN. So I click on VPN, and that's going to return me any of the results that might match. So the known issues that we saw, any FAQs or knowledge that might help me, or where I need to go to actually report an issue. And if I was coming to the portal for another reason, such as ordering a, a new mobile phone, I can do exactly the same. And again, I can see FAQs and knowledge around my entitlements and my allowances for that new mobile phone, or where I might need to go to actually request that new mobile device. And following that link would take me through to a different set of progressive capture questions and the information that needs to be provided. So with all that in mind, let's go and have a look at actually an analyst view of this or where these services were actually created in the first place. So we're just switching now into the context of a, an analyst, and I'm logged in here as Graham. Graham can see the notifications about that incident that we've just raised from the service portal because it was being assigned to one of his teams. And these notifications can be picked up either through the full browser client here, or it can be picked up on the native iOS or Android apps uh, that are available with Service Manager, or of course you could get email notifications about that. But let's start by just having a quick look at those services that we saw on the service portal and how these hang together. So we'll just have a look at the home working service that we were viewing from a portal perspective. And here we're going to see all of the things I'm, I'm sure you're expecting to see, but we'll just cover off some of the key ones. Here we can see the portfolio status of that particular service, so it was in catalogs, which is why we saw it. We can see who subscribed to that service and how they're subscribed, and you can define those groupings. So only those that have subscribed will see the service options or any news or bulletins that relate to it. We can also see which teams support this service, and this could be important if you have a need to have uh, walls or barriers between teams, so you can only see tickets that belong to your teams, or you can only assign tickets to teams that work or support that particular service. All those options are available. We can see ownership. We can see that it was flagged as impacted. We can drill into the request configuration for this service to have a look at what instant and service request configuration options we want to define, the catalog items and what underpins them from uh, a business process perspective, the uh, uh, customer feedback questions that we want to offer and the uh, how long we want them to be valid for, but also things like form design, uh, category tree structures, underpinning email templates, all of that will be configured nice and easily here. We can also come in and manage any bulletins or news that we want to push out. We can define the FAQs and embed those and also have one viewpoint in terms of the feedback and how many times they've been accessed. But we can also look at this 
uh, from an infrastructure perspective and say, actually, how do we provide this service? What actually enables us to do that? And we can see the linked CIs here. Or if we wanted to, we could actually explore this service and we could look at it a little bit more granularly. We could look at all the requests that have been raised against this, or we could reduce that noise down and just start having a look at actually the software and hardware that underpin this service, have a look at the bi-directional relationships that exist between that hardware and software. And here we can see not only um, <clears throat> which software is used, uh, what software it's, uh, sorry, which device it's installed on, but who owns this particular software. All of that is visible here from the, um, from the visual uh, configuration view. Going back up though and having a look at the uh, installed applications that are deployed on your instance, and Simon alluded to this, it is a collaborative platform with line of business applications that are deployed. Each user will, be, will have rights and roles attributed to them, which will govern which applications they see uh, and which options they have available to them uh, when they're using those applications. But we'll have a look at the request list, which is you know, a traditional view for our, our analyst community. And the key thing here really is that it's context sensitive. So it's only going to show Graham on this occasion the, the tickets that he has the rights to view. And that could be based on his rights to work with incidents, service requests, or changes. If he didn't have the right to work with change, he just wouldn't see that icon. But here I can select to look at all of my request types, and I can do so based on a specific team that I belong to, or if I belong to multiple teams, I can filter this by uh, all tickets that belong to any of my teams, all tickets that have been logged against services that my teams support, ones I'm working on personally, or a number of the other default views. So I'll just set that to all request types for all of my teams, and we can see the list refresh. I can come in here, though, and use the, the quick filter or the multifunctional filter here to look for everything that was VPN related here. I can see that I've got 20 that fit into that category. Or if I'm interested in what my colleague's working on at the moment, I can hear, see here that Brian's got this many requests that he's responsible for. Or if I was on the phone to a customer, maybe I want to see what active requests um, my teams have got for Anna, and we can see all of that information presented here. But as well as having these default options and filter options, we can provide each analyst with the ability to customize how they work and the views that they work within. So here we can see a number of views that I've created for myself or ones that have been shared with me. But if I drill down into my high priority instant view that I've configured, here it is just a case of using a simple clause builder to build the conditions that I want for this particular view. So I've got the obviously priority is high. If I wanted to make this specific to a particular service I was interested in, I'll just follow this, the steps here and build those conditions. So it affords me the ability to create my own views and decide to share those with individuals or teams. But what I can also do off the back of those views is start to create charts and content that I want for my own personal dashboard. So here we might have a high priority incident view, but I might want to create some charts that show me which of my teams are responsible for those high priority incidents, or which individuals within those teams are actually looking after them. Maybe I want to have a slightly different view on that, which is which of my sites are impacted. Or taking it um, down another level, I might want to have a look at which individuals are actually impacted by this. So I can go ahead and say, well, just show me this as a, a donut chart. We'll save that. And I can see here that Anna and Steve are the ones that are mainly impacted by these high priority incidents. Once I've created those charts, I have the option from my request list to toggle between that traditional request list view and my personal dashboard to then see all of the charts that I've just created. And we can see here that high priority incident one that I've defined. And because it is my own personal dashboard, I can move things around, hide them, expand them. Uh, and all of these charts will provide some drill down capability straight out of the box so I can get back to those underlying tickets. And if I wanted to, I can export those to CSV, deciding on what information I want to take out as well. So at this point, that really leads us on to looking at options for raising requests and working on requests. Now, we've already, already looked at the, uh, the option to raise from the self-service portal. There are three other options that are available to you. One of those is raising requests via email. And in Service Manager, we provide you with the ability to embed your shared mailboxes into the platform. So here we're just really effectively acting like an Outlook client and viewing all the emails that have been sent into your support at company mailbox or multiple mailboxes, if you will. And here we can review those emails and we can raise new requests from them or apply them to existing tickets. Or we can use our automated um, rule engine that will allow you to automatically create tickets from an email about this triage stage or automatically update a ticket to an existing, sorry, an email to an existing ticket if the reference number is in the subject line. So all of those options are available, uh, as is the ability to raise tickets from third-party tools using our uh, published XML uh, APIs. And the fourth option would then obviously be raising this if the phone rings or there's a walk-in or, uh, or you sort of speak to one of your colleagues um, in, the, in the hallway. So just before we raise a request, 
I just want to introduce you to two underpinning concepts and I'm just going to switch to the admin tool to do so. So here within the context of our service manager configuration, I wanted to introduce our business processes and progressive capture. Now the business processes are what kick in immediately after a request is raised. And we do ship without the box instant problem change, uh, known error processes, but as you can see here, you've got the ability to come in and define um, a few or as many as you need um, if you've got specific business processes. The key thing here is that you'll build your processes using a simple drag and drop canvas. And one of the key tenants here is that it's a non-prescriptive business process tool, so you shouldn't have to tweak your processes to fit in with this particular um, design uh, utility. But what it does mean is that um, <clears throat> you can come in here and if you want to use or configure service level management options, you can within your business processes. You might, for instance, say uh, you might want to use a fix target but not a response target. You might want to determine that the timer starts at a particular point and should be marked as being achieved at another. All of those steps you can define yourself. There's nothing hard coded into Service Manager. You can also come into your processes and define multiple stages, which will be represented by a heads up display, the same as we saw in the self service portal. You can come in and you can define routing, round robin assignment. You can do task allocation, approvals. You can have decisions and checkpoints and a variety of other suspend operations that might be available to you here. <clears throat> the beauty though is all of this maturity and options is all hidden from anybody that's actually engaging with a ticket that's running a process and it's all hidden behind a heads up display. Now that's all concerned with the actual fulfillment of a process but the logging experience is also another area that we've looked at very closely and we've tried to align this much more to what you're used to doing in your own consumer lives. So if you were booking a holiday online or you're taking out some sort of insurance, car insurance online, you'll go to one of these websites, you'll be guided through a series of questions, and by the end of it, you've either booked your holiday um, or you've taken out your insurance. The key thing is that's completely different to how things are in the, in the sort of traditional world, should we say, with, um, excuse me, with legacy systems where you open up a big instant logging form and you're presented with a spreadsheet on steroids, if you will, lots of fields. You never know which ones to complete for different scenarios. So what we've done here is introduce progressive capture, which allows you to build how those questions are asked, how they're presented, depending on the answer, where they root, and what questions get um, asked next. So we go back and have a look at what this actually looks like in practice, and I'll come back up here to raise my new request. Now I could go ahead and raise a new instant or a service request, but one of the other challenges we've seen is that people generally don't know if it's an instant or a service request at the point they pick the phone up. So they often find themselves in the wrong logging form and having to actually switch to the correct logging form ask the customer to repeat themselves, um, or actually having to cancel a ticket and raising a new one. But here with the raise new option, what we're actually suggesting is that you simply go through the process of gathering the information um, before you decide what type of request it is. So here we can see that I've used myself as the customer, I can see uh, that it's the right person from the right site. Maybe I'm simply calling to get an update on an existing ticket. If I was, I can drill into that ticket and give the user the information. If not, which services does the end user take from us? What are they possibly calling about? What predefined catalog options are available to them? Have they just upgraded and they're experiencing an issue? If so, I can click on that and it's very quick and I move on. If it was a link issue, do I want to report that? If I'm working from home, other options that are available. If it's more generic and you just want to capture some information, if I follow the desktop support route, it's then going to start asking me for details of that specific issue. So we'll just follow the thread that we had earlier. So we'll put here, unable to connect. Uh, able to work remotely on here. And it may be at this point that we actually know enough to say, well, I know who it is, I know which service is against, I know there's a break fix issue, maybe I'll raise it as an incident. But just for argument's sake, I could go down the change route, and here I can see that I've got one question which is asking me to upload any supporting documentation. However, if I go back down the more obvious route, which is incident, it might guide me, guide me through actually categorizing this and deciding whether these questions are mandatory. Do we want the users to have a go at prioritizing this? Do we want to um, have the option to associate one or multiple um, CIs when we're logging that ticket? The options are entirely up to you. We've got validation on the right-hand side, and as soon as that request is raised, I can drill in that and start working on that request. And when I'm working on the request, I can see that heads-up display that the business process has automatically created for me based on my stages. I can see checkpoints show me what's happened so far and what needs to happen next. I can see that an email has been sent, it's been assigned to a team, and the priority was set during the progressive capture. But it's also showing me that no one in that team owns that ticket yet, so it's taken me in context on the action bar to where I need to perform that particular function. So I'm going to come in here and I can see that my colleagues are either 
available, not available, if they're on holiday, when they'll be back. But I'm actually going to pick this one up myself, and I'm going to go ahead and assign that to me. Now, on doing so, the heads-up display checkpoint is marked. It moves on to the next stage. And in this particular example, it's actually created a, uh, an activity that could have, been, could have been assigned to the owner or a group or a role to go ahead and investigate. We can see below here the timeline, which is your audit trail of everything that's happened. And we can come in here and we can do all the things I'm sure you're expecting to do, like uh, adding in screenshots, which might be your error, um, or various other functions. And I'm not going to go ahead and do all of these for today, but just going to showcase a couple. So again, we can see the, uh, the image in line here. We can add up um, any sort of update, decide if they're going to be customer facing. You could add and schedule callbacks and get reminders. You can drag and drop multiple files in here. You can go looking for related tickets that might help you solve your issue. Here I can see lots of VPN related tickets, so I'm just going to narrow that down to any problems that are still open. And we'll do another search on that. Great, I can see there's just the one. Uh, so I might choose to link my incident to that particular uh, problem. And on doing so, that problem may have a, a workaround, so that solution is passed down to me. I can review it, accept it if it's appropriate or not. All those options are available to me on here. But just thinking about that whole collaborative aspect and, and how that underpins your service management, there's a number of features and functions that will, uh, that will benefit you here. One of those is the ability to actually drop in subject matter experts as and when you need them. And this just complements the ability to assign a ticket away once you've finished working on it or create an activity for another team. It's slightly more uh, informal, if you will. So here I might want to bring in our change manager into this particular conversation. So I'm going to drop uh, Rosemary in as a, uh, uh, as a member. Now this might elevate Rosemary's rights because she doesn't normally have the rights to look at my team's calls or my incidents, uh, incident class generally and that will just elevate her rights for this particular request. I could also then come in and I could mention Rosemary, I can see she's offline, but I want to let her know what assistance is actually needed. So I can send her a targeted communication. So Rose, please, can you take a look? So by doing that, she's going to get a notification which is fired out through the platform, again, either through the uh, notifications in the browser or through the um, iPhone or Android apps. You can pick those up so she'll always be informed. As well as that, other features you've got available are the ability to follow tickets, which means that any updates to those tickets will be pushed out to your, uh, to your timeline, and I'll show you your timeline uh, and your news feed uh, shortly. But just jumping up from here and looking at some of the other options, we could raise a problem or a known error directly off this particular incident, or I could go straight up from an incident into change, uh, and from here I might be guided through a series of questions to, to raise this change. You know, what type of change is it, in my opinion, what's the impact level? Uh, what's the risk, etc., just to provide this information to the change management team. And on doing so, when we come in and have a look at this change, it was really just to demonstrate that <clears throat> we'll have different heads-up display, again, based on the business process that's running, but there'll be a lot of familiarity in terms of being guided through the, the, the questions and queries that need to be answered. Here there's a task for the change team to actually review um, whether this change request is actually valid to, to take any further forward, and I might be putting in the time I've spent and choosing from the definable outcomes pushing information into our timesheet manager app so we can look at how much time these users or individuals are actually spending on different activities. And I'll go ahead here and I'll just say, okay, well, we've done the first task, it's valid, maybe we want to do an impact assessment. Here I might uh, mark this one as being of a low impact, and as a result of that, it might bypass the need for a back out plan, go through to an approval stage, etc., etc. All of these are just definable by your processes. But the reason I wanted to do this was to actually introduce the concept of our visual boards. Because as an analyst, I might be quite comfortable working through a list of my requests. But as the change manager or a, a business owner, I might actually want to look at all of the changes that are currently in flight against our, against our change process at any given time. And these boards give us a way of actually reflecting the life cycle stages of that underlying business process. So here I can see all of my changes that are incoming, those ones that have been assessed and those that have been uh, sat with CAB approved and so on. And here we can see that that change we've just raised here has already made its way across to being with CAB. And that's because our business process tool will automatically move it across to the relevant lifecycle stage as we complete the tasks or activities that have been assigned. So it gives us that real-time bird's eye view of exactly what's in flight and if we want to know who's actually responsible for what. So I can drill down here and just look at Graham's uh, tickets or take that back up. But you could also use boards for, um, if you're using this from a development point of view, to look at all of your incoming stories requirements ready. If you're using uh, service requests for procurement, you can have a look at all the different stages of your procurement. Or if you're doing incident management and you were using escalations within your timers, you might get email reminders and reassignments happening, 
happening as well, but you might also want to promote ones onto this board that shows you stuff that's going to breach very, very shortly. Okay, So that just gives you a sort of flavour and feel for, for what we can do here. We're just going to come back to that change that we were looking at, and I'm just going to drill into uh, the authorization because I'm a part of the cab on this one, and we're just going to go ahead and accept that. Now, the reason for doing that is if I now come up to my news feed, and we talk again about this collaborative aspect, we can see here that that change uh, request that we were working on has now been published out to a change management workspace. And these workspaces are just areas where you can come together to collaborate on different subject matter. And they could be used for, for, for argument's sake, having a change management workspace that lets interested parties know when changes have been approved, have been implemented, and have been uh, successfully deployed and reviewed without the need for them to look at requests or look at boards. That information can be pushed to them. It could also be pushed to them if we're talking about major incidents um, or problems. But it could also be used from a, a tacit knowledge perspective. And again, this is coming back to what Simon was talking about earlier. So we might want to create something like a first-line FAQ workspace where we invite in our first-line team, our second-line team, or our subject matter experts. And we give them a, a facility where they can come in and they can post um, comments and ideas. They can ask questions of their, of their peers and their colleagues. So here we could say, James has got a problem that his customer is experiencing. He can post that question. Pablo and Pierre, in their local languages, can come in and they can provide answers, obviously because we're a very helpful team. The other good thing here is the rest of the team can validate the answers that are being provided. So on this occasion, James knows that Pablo's answer will allow him to resolve his customer's issue the quickest. Now those conversations probably happen by email, they probably happen by the coffee machine, and they all have the, the same end result in the short term, but by capturing this information here, if, if James or Pablo moved on, or got promoted or whatever it might be, that information from the business might be lost. But because we've captured it here in the tool, we can start to search that information. And if I went looking for any VPN or Shrewsoft related issues in the future, I can start to look for results. I can see other information that's been posted. I could limit that to just anything posted in the last six months, for argument's sake, if we had, if we had an upgrade in that time. Or just show me what Pablo's posted because he's our subject matter expert. Or just limit it down to a particular workspace. I might go first line FAQs here. Again, I can see one, one relevance-based result. I can see Brian's provided an answer, and I can see that we've got some validation of that particular answer. So this is just really sort of demonstrating some of the collaborative features. And it's really just a comment on here. Service Manager or our Document Manager app, which looks after our explicit knowledge, these are just examples of line of business applications that are deployed on the platform. Here with a, with a, um, a document that we've deployed, we can see who we've shared this document with. We can keep full revision histories of those documents, and we've got a timeline that allows us to discuss and collaborate on the content. We can tag these documents, we can mark them as being in the relevant lifecycle status, and we can push those out into libraries at the point where we're, to, we're, we're happy to share those more, more openly. Well, the challenges we're trying to address here are ones that are associated with having multiple versions of a document floating around on network shares or being discussed via email. We never actually know if we're actually looking at the most um, up-to-date or recent version. Here, we'll only ever have one version of that document in circulation at any given time. As well as having those documents and those applications that are on here, Timesheet Manager or Customer Manager, you have, you're going to have tasks and activities that underpin all of those applications. And they're all delivered and presented out to me, either through my side panel, along with our bookmarks and our instant messaging that the platform provides. But I can also look at my activities in a variety of different formats. Here I might, for argument's sake, have a view set up for my team, which looks after our suppliers and contract management. And I can look at all of the activities relating to our documents and contracts that are up for review in the next 30, 60, or 90 days. I've got traditional list views, and I've also got calendar views as well. So with all of that in mind, we're putting all this information together. How do we get any meaningful analytics out of that? And I'm just going to come back up to our admin tool and look at our advanced analytics that sets alongside the personal dashboards that we saw earlier. And one of, one of the key tenants of this is our trending engine. And this allows you to build measures to look at things like your average resolution times, how many tickets you're raising or closing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. The key thing, though, is to set targets for those measures and then decide what um, periodic period you want to um, capture that data over and then see how you're performing against those targets over time and how that they're trending. And with all that data being collated, you can go ahead and use those measures to create widgets. And widgets can be lists or count, uh, target counters or traditional charts. And you can add those widgets onto dashboards and you can share those dashboards with individuals or roles. What you could also do, though, if you've got a lot of data, is actually daisy-chain dashboards together. So you can start to have a look at some of the metrics that are available. So here we can see a very graphical view of how many are open, how many have been closed today, 
things that haven't been touched in a week, or what's your actual um, age call report. You might see things like when a call is being reported, what day is your most prominent, what's the source of those calls, how are you doing against your service level targets, how are you doing year on year, month on month, how many tickets being raised out of hours. Again, nice visual ones that are looking at tickets that haven't been touched or been unresolved. If you're getting knowledge, which what search terms are people looking for that you don't provide for? What knowledge articles are being looked at and aren't? Who's providing the feedback uh, to these particular knowledge articles? Customer feedback, once tickets have been resolved, how many are still awaiting? What are the star ratings? What are the answers and percentage answers to the questions? What's the feedback when ratings are below a two or a three? All of these are configurable in your personal dashboards. So again, I'm now going to pass you back to Simon, who's also just going to talk about some of the non-functional benefits of working with Hornbook. Thanks a lot, Steve. Okay, guys, I'm just going to pick up here. Yeah, so what I wanted to do now is just um, talk about some of the non-functional benefits. But equally, what I would say is after this, um, any questions that you've submitted through the webinar, bit, myself and Steve would be more than happy to ask. So again, if there are questions that you want to ask, please submit them and we can deal with them in a moment. So again, what I wanted to talk about now was some of the non-functional benefits. Why Hornbill? Well, what we have here, here is three of our core values. Customer first. Well, essentially, here everything that we do in Hornbill is around our customers and making it, um, our customers first in everything we do. That's not just around the application. That's also around the service that we offer. Partnership through collaboration. Well, Steve's just done a fantastic demonstration of showing you how we use collaboration around service management. But equally, we use collaboration within an organization as well. And this indeed is how we improve the product. So through collaboration and portals, um, through our forums, we can engage with our customers and our partners to develop our solution. And indeed, our customers can talk to our support teams as well. So again, this is how our product actually evolves. And finally, quality not compromise you know you've seen um, a high quality um, application that Steve's demonstrated but equally uh, we provide quality around our service and also around our engagement um, with us as an organization and I'll come back um, a little bit uh, in a while to show you about how we actually measure and keep that high quality available to our customers but here at Hornbill we I just wanted to talk to you about um, the 30-day um, satisfaction guarantee what we found is with Service Manager, we've changed our whole sales engagement with our customers. And what we found is certainly when you're buying a new piece of application, it's typically a selection is done off the back of um, a demonstration or maybe multiple demonstrations, or it's a paper-based exercise, maybe going through a tender or an RFI. And in some cases, when you actually get the solution in play, it's not quite as you imagined it would be. Here at Hornbill, we provide 100% uh, risk-free 30-day guarantee which enables you to actually under, understand the application well in advance of actually you having to actually purchase it. And how do we go about that? Well, we've changed our engagement, and what we want to do is, you know, you can put us to the test, and there's four key areas where you can actually examine the application and service that we offer. So the first one, putting us to the test, is what we do is we allow you to have 30 days access to the service. And what this enables you to do is look at the performance, the scalability, does it have the reporting that you need, the process, and equally you can look at all the, uh, the functionality and how that aligns to you, your business requirements going forward. Now to help with that 30 days, we offer a free implementation where a product specialist will be assigned to you, and essentially what we believe here in Hornbill is that um, you shouldn't have to pay to stand up your, your solution, and what we do here is we provide the ability to have your data inputted, we help with the integration points around um, Active Directory, um, and any other data sources that you may have. So again, it allows you to actually fully understand the application um, in detail. We also offer free training. Now, free training at this stage has uh, two benefits. It, it enables you to make an intuitive choice through the 30 days because you're fully trained. And equally, if you take the application on, you've got all the training and the expertise that you need to be self-sufficient to, to take, take Service Manager into your organisation. And finally, at the end of the 30 days, there's a choice to be made. Now, essentially, it is an accept or reject. You either accept the solution and you start subscribing, or equally, you walk away. Now, uh, when we put it to the test, you know, 95% of our customers actually sign up, and they're very happy. But again, the 5% that don't, they've, come, they've made that decision from uh, an informed position where they've had the knowledge to actually look at the application and actually decide it's not quite for them. And that's great, because... No, no there's, no, there's no commercial arrangement there. They have the ability to understand the application and move forward. So again, 
we're really changing here at Hornby how, how we engage with our customers. Um, and we want to give them an experience that's very seamless and have the ability to actually understand the application in great detail. Now, finally, before we just look at um, any questions that have been submitted, I want to talk about just the four, um, four key areas around the Hornbill difference. Now, we've talked around our innovation around technology, a collaborative approach, how we've changed our sales cycle to give you know, a 30-day free trial to any prospects that want to look at our um, application. There's probably four key areas just to touch on. I mentioned earlier, you know, we're providing um, a service, not software. So this is a SaaS base. It's a native SaaS based solution. And the idea here is there's no upgrades. The customers keep working. And essentially what we want you to do is concentrate on supporting your customers. And we're concentrating on supporting you with the service. A price for life. Um, again, what we've done here is we want to give you simple, predictable costs. So there's no hidden charges in the second and third year. So again, what we've done is we've created the ability for you to have a price. Um, that is consistent, it's built into our contract, so again, you know, essentially you're insulated for any increase, and indeed, um, if there are, uh, if we do change our service and we were, we're able to reduce our cost, you can take advantage of that through your contract. I touched upon training as part of the 30 day, but equally we train for life. Um, a lot of organisations go back to market simply because their, their expert or their specialist has left or been promoted, and they don't have that internal knowledge. What Hornbill will do is committed to training up the nominated new person that's going to maintain and support service manager within your organisation. So again, train for life means that we can continue giving them, that partaking and giving you knowledge and expertise in your organisation. Finally, no contractual times. And this comes back to the quality that I mentioned earlier. Um, you essentially are not tied into any contract. It's no um, two or three contract you're signing. Essentially, you can ter um, terminate in convenience. And what this does is drive behavior within the organization so that we constantly have to keep providing um, a solution that is driven by our customers' requirements. And I mentioned the forums earlier. So again, there's a continual um, interaction with our customers, customers to make sure that the solution um, is scalable for them. So again, no, sec uh, no 36 month time, simply you can sign up to um, the service and if you feel it's not for you, you can simply just walk away. Finally, what does it cost? Um, I guess everyone will be asking, well, how much is it? Well, we've got a simple transparent pricing structure. So whether service manager is going to be used for a small team, a large team, or again, a lot across a large organization. The cost is simply built around a simple per user um, pricing. So we see it as with, with the service, you're either consuming it or providing it. If you're consuming it, um, you're essentially an end user coming through the portal that Steve showed earlier. And again, that's free. If you're providing it, then essentially you're working in the service to team, providing service to your organization. And the cost is basically £42.50 per user per calendar month. Now, that's based on the sliding scale. And I mentioned earlier about a price for life. So essentially, when you sign up, you're essentially signing up to that green curve. And again, what you can do is move up and down that curve depending on your usage throughout your duration of your contract. And again, what this provides the comfort to our customers is, is it's simple, predictable costing that they can budget against going forward. So with that, um, I'd just like to say thank you for your time today. And what we'll do is we'll just look at um, some of the questions that come in. And between myself and Steve, we'll be more than happy to provide some explanation to them. Okay. Thanks, Simon. So we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, one actually just touching on your uh, the commercial side here. And um, they're just asking, is it named or concurrent? Uh, good question. It's actually named, um, named subscriptions. It's, we don't provide a concurrent model. Okay. Thank you, Simon. And um, there's another one which is asking about um, data centers and where your information is held. So I, I can answer that Do you one. Want to tell that one. Yeah, certainly. So again, it will depend on the region that you're in. So if you're in the UK, for instance, you're in, in Europe. So your data will reside uh, in, the, in the EU. Uh, so your primary uh, data center, any backups will be. Uh, in the EU and certainly actually if you're in the UK they're actually in the UK if you happen to be a customer in North America it would be in that region uh, accordingly uh, another question we've got here around assets is um, are we able to import assets and again I'll take that one so whether it's assets or users there's various ways that we can import that information uh, from an asset point of view you can either use our CSV tool to upload those maybe those non-networked assets uh, but if you if you use a tool like SECM Snow, Satira, that type of tool. Then you can run scheduled imports. We've got a, a local tool utility that you'll run. You'll connect to 
do your data mapping and then fire that information in on a scheduled basis into your individual instance. Okay. That's it. There are the only questions that come in. So what do we do? Just pass you back to Sarah just to wrap up. Thank you, Stephen and Simon, for taking us through that presentation. I hope everyone found it useful. If you have any additional questions, please do not hesitate to contact me or your relationship manager. Finally, thank you everyone for your time today. Goodbye.